So welcome to another episode of the Venari podcast. On this series of Talking Radio Farm, we're here with Ian Wilson, CEO of Imagine Amp, um, biochemist, 20 years plus, radio pharmaceutical developer. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Matthew. Looking forward to the interview. Excellent. Well, I want to just start and show the audience a bit more about your background. How did you get into the, the biotech world? I went to university at Manchester and very close to Manchester was AstraZeneca. So I had a placement to AstraZeneca when I was a student. And luckily, after graduating, I fell into a job with AstraZeneca. So I went straight into industry after finishing my degree. And what about your transition into radio pharmaceuticals? Yeah, so AstraZeneca, I started doing imaging as part of clinical development. So I thought that was pretty good. And then I have a t- I went for a, a job, a, a company called Amersham International. Mm-hmm. Many people won't remember it, but it, for some people, it was the first company privatized by Margaret Thatcher. And I started working there and it was really radio pharmaceuticals. I was at the lab, you know, developing new drugs. And that company was eventually bought by GE, mm-hmm. and became GE Healthcare. So I was there for over 18 years. I started at the bench and then took successive jobs, worked as a project manager, worked in business development, and then finally became head of biology for G Healthcare. And now you're with Imagine Lab, and tell us about that journey. So like many, you know, working for a large company, you get the, all the benefits, job security, get all the training. But I got to the point in my career where I thought I wanted to do something else. So it was natural to go and work for a biotech company. And I left and went straight to a radiotherapy company uh, called Extrol, which is still going. And that gave me the confidence to work for a smaller organization. And then I made the jump like many to a startup. And I went to an imaging company based in Edinburgh. And from there, enjoying myself. And one day I got a phone call. As you do. (laughs) As you do, on a cold, wet day in November in Scotland. And someone said, would you like to live in Los Angeles? Which of course piques anyone's interest. Mm -hmm. And from there, I went for the interview and thought working for my job would be a fantastic job. And I I went and moved to Imagine Lab six years ago, moved to LA with the family and started there, not as CEO, but as as the chief operating officer. Okay. And for your CEO now, I mean, people have uh, preconceptions about what that what that really means. Can you dispel the notions of of what a CEO looks like? What's it kind of what's it really like? I suppose, you know, I don't dress like a classical CEO, maybe because I live in Los Angeles, but I think that persona of a CEO driving around in a car, being aloof, has gone. I think for many people, even probably in the work environment you're in, you know, I I sometimes say my job job title is Chief Everything Officer. I think in a small company, I do everything from working with the guys in R&D to sales and marketing. And of course, raising money. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I travel like everyone else in economy, staying budget hotels. And, you know, in these times of just budget conscious. So we look after every dollar and pound. Mm-hmm. And what is for our audience that doesn't know Imagine Ab, what is the, the big problem that you're trying to tackle? Yeah. So if you look at the name Imagine Ab, you could take it apart and understand where, where does that come from? And it actually comes from two words imaging Mm -hmm. and antibody and that's where it started it started the company to take biological drugs add a radioactive tag allowing you to visualize disease in the body and about eight years ago we focused on one significant problem which is immuno-oncology in cancer which has been a breakthrough technology in 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 oncology we've seen the great headlines of the people doing really well on those kind of therapies. But unfortunately, it doesn't work for everyone. Probably it works on average for 20% of people who mm. receive those drugs. And we have an imaging agent that can actually image a certain cell in the body known as a T cell. And that T cell is what actually kills the cancer. So we can actually visualize that and we can help drug companies understand whether their drugs are working. So what we're trying to help those drug companies and eventually clinicians is allow them to develop new drugs that work better and for clinicians to be able to select the right drugs for those cancer patients. Mm -hmm. And the company's been going a while now. It's in the successful period. 
what are some new developments that, that we should know about? Yeah, so the company is quite old. It's 16 years old, which is quite old for um, a biotech company. Uh, about two years ago, we decided to add some uh, different projects in R&D. And like many, we saw the uh, emergence of radiotherapy. So we, we knew our technology would be good, not just for imaging. So two years ago, we started active R&D in developing therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. And in the last two years, we've been able to generate two lead compounds, which are going to enter the clinic in the next year or so. And when you look at the, the wider field, you've been in this space for more than 20 years. What are the, what are the key challenges that you think the, the community faces in advancing um, this approach forward? Yes, yeah, so I think it's good to say now that drug companies, larger drug companies like Bayer and Novartis, are bought into radiopharmaceutical therapy. We know it's going to be around for forever and, and drugs will be developed in that area. But if we think back, there is some really simple things like it's very hard to ship these agents around the world. So there are logistics and manufacturing issues that need to be resolved. And many people talk about the supply of the isotopes. Mm -hmm. So you will, wherever you go, people talk about is there enough isotope around to actually do their clinical trials or actually when it gets to market. So there's a lot of thought around that. Something probably close to what you think about is because of the lack of investment in the space, there is a lack of skilled workers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as an employer, you try to hold on to your current employees and you have to be very selective about finding new employees. So I think, you know, there's going to be a growth of, you know, people coming to that business, mm -hmm. wanting to work in that business because it's a great opportunity. And, and how do you attract that talent to imagine our over the competition because it is becoming a more hotly contested space. Yeah, it's very difficult. You know, we can't we can't compete on salary. I'm being honest about that. I suppose we have certain things we can compete on, which is a nice beachfront next to the Pacific. And actually, for some people who've got young families, where we are based is important mm -hmm. in their decision as a as a as a family living. You know, in certain suburbs of Los Angeles, is quite attractive. The other one is, is that we're a small company and our philosophy is to hire people and only hire people that are essential for the business. So people actually get involved in many aspects of the business. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, my job title means everything. When we hire someone, they get involved from the first day of the project all the way, hopefully, to the project launch. So for many, that's quite important that they get to see that, especially if they come from a large business. And of course, like others, we try and incentivize with you know, shares because mm -hmm. we're biotech. So we like to we like our employees to share in the future success of the company. Speaking of what you said there, what are the, the skill sets that you see most in demand uh, from the industry as we move forward? You spoke there about the lack of investment in, in the skills. Yeah, so it's very obvious that there is a, there's a lack of skill in particularly in radiochemistry. You'll see that, you know, people are demanding quite high salaries in that because mm -hmm. there's a lack of that skill. So that's a very obvious one. I think the other one is, is there isn't actually that many people skilled in implementing clinical trials in radiopharmaceutical therapy. They've probably got an experience in oncology mm -hmm. or other clinical trials, but they don't know the subtle nuances that are needed for that. So I think people don't think about that. They think it's easily translatable from, oh, I worked in oncology, this Actually, I, I don't think that's true. I think, you know, there is a need to understand certain complexities of radiopharmaceuticals when you are designing a clinical trial or making sure you can get it delivered to sites. Yeah, I hear that all the time. There's a, um, a bit of a tug, a, a pull between the nuclear medicine uh, physicians, um, uh, the, the radiation oncologists and the classical oncologists and that ownership of patients and owning the the clinical pathway. Um, I think that's going to be a um, an important kind of thing to play out over the years as the as the space matures. Yeah, I think you're hundred percent correct. Uh, I think, unfortunately, in America, it's about who owns the patient. Yeah, so the oncologist wants to own the patient, or the nuclear medical interventional oncologist. So I think it will it will thrash out, and they will find a place. I think the key issue with 
the care path of these people is the requirement to image them before mm -hmm. they get a treatment and actually then to measure the radioactive dose that people get. So there needs to be a partnership between someone who maybe works in the oncology field, they will have to partner with the nuclear medics and interventional radiologists to make sure that patient receives the right care and right, mm -hmm. and right drug at the right time and make sure it's safe for them. Mm -hmm. That's great, thanks for your insight there. When you look at the field broadly, as, you, as we've discussed, being in the space more than 20 years, you've been at Amersham GE, you've seen this right from its inception. When you look at the field, what are people missing? What should our, what should our listeners look out for that, that isn't perhaps so obvious? So in oncology care, you know, most people automatically think people just get a drug. But sometimes they forget they also get radiotherapy and now they get radiotherapy drugs. So I think sometimes people forget that patients receive multiple drugs. In, in radiotherapy today, what we work in, it, it's only impacting end stage disease. So it's great and it's you know, making people live longer. Mm -hmm. For it to have a true impact, it's actually got to go down and be, end up being curative. So I think it's, you know, we, we, we hope we can see that. And I think what's also, when you look at the scientific literature, I think there is a need to actually do combination. Mm -hmm. So it won't be just people receive a radiotherapy, they will also re receive a standard drug. And recently at ESMO, there was data for the PSMA, radiotherapies that showed that using a drug with it is synergistic and leads to better outcome of those patients. That's fantastic. That's very important, I think, as uh, just to increase chances and outcomes for patients yes. overall. Um, Rounding up the conversation, what advice would you give to budding scientists or developers or those interested in, in entering this, this growing field of nuclear medicine of radiopharmaceuticals? Yeah, so if you look at people who come from, uh, say, biology, chemistry, and physics background, there's, there's opportunities for all three of them. You know, for, if you look at physics, people can think, well, actually one of our employees did astrophysics mm -hmm. and now he works in medical physics. So people who may have gone down that route soon realise that image capture and what they do as a translation into medical care. So I think for the physics community, there's, you know, there's people that who should think about, you know, a, a career in the medical side of imaging and dosimetry. From a chemistry point of view, you know, there's a natural jump to be a radiochemist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are multiple jobs that the, you can do that. And also that's the same for biologists. It's, if you're interested in drug development, then drug development's um, is exciting in, in, in what we do in radiotherapy because actually we can get, we can see what we do. We can take a picture yes, and amazing. see what it works while working in standard drug development. You can't, it takes a long time to actually see what happens, but we can see it in real time. So, and also you can then develop your career. You can, all those disciplines can go into project management. They can go into regulatory affairs and quality. And all those are jobs that are hard crying out to be filled in in our business thanks for that Ian. is there is there anything else that we haven't covered that you'd like to add um of course you know i'm not being trite uh, i think it's important that most people have a good support of their family you know my uh, yeah my wife and children have followed me around the world and supported me through the good and bad times so it's really good to have that kind of support from your family especially when you travel a lot and have to work long hours so you know, if I can thank someone, it would be my family. That's good. I'm glad. I'm sure she'll be happy to, to get hear that. She will do. Well, again, thanks for uh, appearing on this episode of the Night Podcast of Talking Radio Farm. And um, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you, Matthew.